This is the OGM uh, weekly check-in call for Thursday, February 17th, 2022. We are here to check in. Um, and it's lovely to see everybody. Uh, we were just talking about a podcast interview that Doug recorded some time ago and then rediscovered recently and then Stacy listened to and and uh, moved Stacy a bunch. And I'm going to post that link in the chat just in just as a way of starting us off because I've got it handy. Uh, think, think, think if anybody wants to watch it. Um, and then we're going to just go around and as people show up, we'll talk about uh, what is OGM in our lives. And I just wanted to, I wanted to start off by checking in with two things. Um, one is this week I, I bumped my routines and schedules and everything sort of pretty reasonably dramatically. And I've been starting every day just by sitting with um, like me and trying to figure out why don't I sit with me more often? Why don't I show up the way I want to show up in the world? And uh, it's been really interesting and it's still, <clears throat> still in progress and still going on. Um, and as part of that, um, once I've figured out some of those pieces, I'll, uh, uh, I'll probably try to, I'll ask for your help in, in reconfiguring what we're doing in these efforts. Like right now there's a bunch of standing calls that are standing calls because, because grandma used to cut the ends off the ham because the oven was too small, <clears throat> which is why we still cut the ends off the ham. Right, and so let's let's see if we can't uh, tackle ourselves uh, in some in some more uh, not organized but intentional way. I think that would be really good. Um, and a piece of the work I'm trying to do is about grief and forgiveness and some things like that, uh, and also sort of looking inside a bit more. And then the second thing is that I I'm I'm just stood up and finally have a, a website for Picture's Brain. Uh, which is, um, I've, I've, this open global mind has been a, a, a labor of love and is totally fun. And at some point I need to figure out like, how do I, how do I turn what I love to do into some form of income? And picture his brain as a, as a way to do that. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, basically, I have two brains. I did a, I did a video long ago um, uh, that says I have two brains and they're both open. Uh, and I, here's the, uh, my brains are open, there we go. Uh, and I was basically playing on, on uh, Paul Erdos, the mathematician who uh, toward the end of his life traveled uh, visiting other mathematicians. And uh, I don't know that he ever showed up unannounced. I don't know enough about the actual rhythm of it, but he would show up at somebody's house and say, my brain is open. And then he would live with the family for four, five, six months and write pap papers with the mathematician in the family. And at this point, uh, the Erdos number is like a Kevin Bacon, you know, six degrees of Kevin Bacon number. And if your Erdos number is low, that means you were a co-author uh, on papers with Paul Erdos and, uh, and so on. And then uh, he's a little bit like Kevin Bacon in that there's so many, the web of papers that, that relate to him is, is pretty gigantic. Um, anyway, for pictures brain, I've got this one on board, which is not a bad strategy brain. And then I've got the one that you've seen a bunch uh, that I bring into things that I've been curating for 24 years, and the two together are pretty interesting. And if you go to Pictures Brain, you'll find you can see um, a session that I recorded with Wendy McLean, and then I just finished editing another one I did a couple of days ago with Scott Mooring, uh, which are sort of sample uh, sessions of uh, uh, of this whole thing. And um, anybody you know if, who might be interested, please refer. Um, that would be great. I haven't set up a referral program. I should probably do that <coughs> or, a, or a bounty or something. I don't know, that sounds so commercial. Uh, so my apologies for that, but I'm trying to figure out how to, how to stand in the middle of, of the things we're, we love to do and uh, occasionally make a living from doing so. Um, that said, let's go around the room and check in as we often do. Um, Grace is eating, so I'll wait until I call on you a little bit later. Uh, let's go Stuart, Dave, Mark Carranza. Oh my, okay. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, it, it's, it's a full plate. 
Um, uh, and I, I was teaching last night between um, 7 and 10 uh, p.m. for me, working with folks um, at Fiji Telecom. All right. And <laughs> I hate to say this, you guys, you guys, many of you who work in tech will appreciate this. Their telecom was not good. <laughs> but it was really kind of a pleasure to work cross-culturally um, and to um, see uh, after uh, a very short period of time how much we are uh, all alike. Uh, beneath some very, very surface differences. Um, uh, I've been uh, enjoying the first session we had yesterday of the, uh, the project that Ken Homer uh, organized about, about climate. Um, and then it was interesting that in this morning news feed, uh, Seth Godin's got a new book um, called Almanac where he has like 300 of the of people currently looking at what's going on. Um, and, and, uh, and I just got a note for my girlfriend this morning. Do you want me to, do you want me to buy this book for you? Do you want me to get, get this book for me, which I thought was really, really sweet. Uh, um, and probably most, you know, not that many people know on this call, not that I have been a real activist uh, as, as Gil, uh, has been, but I was a, a an Al Gore volunteer uh, and was teaching the climate science um, for a while, you know, back around 2003, 4, 5, 6 uh, in, in that slice of time. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon to me that about six months ago, I decided that I only want to be in conversations that matter. And aside from this one, there's a few others going on. Um, and um, it's really, um, I'm really pleased to have made that, made that shift. Uh, who knows if the tilting at windmills I do has any meaning, but um, I'm dancing as fast as I can. That's my check-in. <laughs> Stuart, thank you. That's great. Thank you. And uh, I know, uh, I think Pete also, we know way too many people who've worked in the wrinkly corners of the world installing uh, internet access and Wi-Fi and broadband and point-to-point -point other weird things and, and all that. And uh, these people are awesome. They're, um, one of them is Dave Hughes, the Cursor Cowboy. Uh, there's, a <laughs> there's a bunch of others, but it's a been a bunch of years of people trying to trying to weave the world together actually technically right exactly um let's go uh dave witzel uh, mark carranza stacy hi everybody um i'm dave i'm sitting in oakland california it's a beautiful day outside today um and gosh what else been well the, you know the conversation i really would like to have is i would love to talk about how to fund open source software um so, and I actually don't want to talk about how you talk about funding it, but I'm kind of curious, actually, I was I'm riffing off of the, uh, the exciting exchanges on the email list, but, uh, um, but I'm actually really interested in the topic. And I kind of feel like the model of how we funded open source software kind of as a civic commons applies to data as well. And I'm involved in a couple of projects that have a data layer that where you want the data, I think, to be available in the commons. But somehow it needs to be funded, and you know you, have, you still have average costs that you have to, to fund, but you want the marginal cost to be close to zero. So, I feel like data is an example of a, an abundant resource that we don't want to make scarce and it be extractive with, but we still don't have a tool to do that. And it feels like this is a group that would have a lot of insights and what the ways are to do that kind of thing. So, I would love to have that conversation. Um, and then another just kind of broad one. I haven't really been. I haven't been. Uh, uh, um, given responsibility for this, but a very dear friend of ours just uh, became head of the Berkman Center this week out of Harvard. And the Berkman Center is, uh, you know, was established 20 years ago or so around the internet and society. And, you know, she's gonna have to recraft a kind of a mission statement for it. And I think it's different, but I'm not sure how it's different, you know? And I kind of grew up in the, in the old Berkman Center when they were all my heroes were kind of fellows at the, at the place. And it's like, well, what should they be thinking about today? 
you know, and I, I'm Who's really curious. Head? Sue Hendrickson. Oh, okay. She's a, a Kennedy School buddy. Uh, um, love that. That's that's really cool. But anyway, so another topic possibility is, you know, I'm really curious. Um, let me scroll back to open source for a second. Can you talk about how, like, I'm going to ask this wrong, but where are you stuck in 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 the process, or what are the what are the hot questions for you? Like, what 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 have you found that worked? What have you found that broke? And what's the edge you're at? So the, there's a couple of cases. One's you know my wife's case where she's doing um, uh, aggregating health data in California, and right now it's largely being funded through um, the health insurance companies. And probably, you know, arguably ought to be funded through the state, but like nobody kind of wants to take responsibility for funding the infrastructure that makes the data available. And they're just now getting to a point in California where health, the California Medicaid program will pay for ancillary things uh, that affect health, for example, uh, housing. So there's a new program that's just launching now where in because of health issues, you can get funding for housing. Right, so we're starting to see the integration across kind of the civic sectors. And, you know, it's coming from health, which I think is where all the money tends to be, but the effects are gonna be, you know, a lot of other places. And you expect this stuff to be data-driven, I think, but the data doesn't really exist. And you can see that from our response to the pandemic, the public health, the individual data doesn't exist for healthcare, but the public health data doesn't exist either, right? Our systems are really suck. Um, and they're, they're, they're disaggregated, they're spread across the state and counties and hospitals and doctors and, you know, and dentists never even get considered into any of this stuff, which is like bar baffles me. But um, anyway, so, so there's, a, there's a very concrete question, which is you need this infrastructure, they're starting to build this infrastructure, they're a few years in, they're making really good progress, but they don't have a financial sustainability uh, plan yet. Right, They're, they've got they've got a few things in the works, but it hasn't come together yet. So, who funds it and how do they fund it? Kind of is, is a very concrete question. And then another one is is uh, stuff that actually I've been listening to Hodgson on around um, environmental data, kind of climate, but hopefully much broader than climate. Um, again, we, we we're going to want I think a, a data infrastructure that serves farmers and serves you know business people and. Um, people who are doing biodiversity and all kinds of different things. And the, the data set is kind of interrelated. Somebody needs to manage it. Somebody needs to make sure that it's available for, for actually productive work. You know, I guess one of my assumptions is we don't really want the government or the UN to do this because they suck at it. Uh, you really want, you know, you want a Linux foundation to do it. Um, and so those are the cases that, I, that I've got. And the, and the issue is like, even on the, on the email discussion yesterday the re, or the other day, the reaction was kind of like, well, you need a red hat to fund things, which is how Linux got started. And that's like an insult that we, an insight that we had 20, you know, 15 years ago. What have we learned since then? You know, who else is doing this? And what, what are the models? And who, what are the, what's the governance look like? You know, who gets to decide how the data is used? Um, a lot of people talk about having for individual data that the person owns the data, which kind of makes sense. And especially maybe in like in an in indigenous people's colonialism kind of sense, that way it makes sense. But if people own the data, then it's not abundant. It's, you know, so anyway, the, I feel like these issues are genuine issues. They're really important, high leverage issues for a societal value model. And I just don't think that we've um, explored them as much as, like we know more than we, than we can, can frame, I guess, is the issue. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. um, Pete has his hand up and I think I saw Sean raise his hand as well. So, uh, so I, I misread that. Let's go to Pete. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Jay. Um, I, it, it makes me think of uh, a buddy I've got, uh, and and some of some of us know him, uh, Jim Fruchterman. Um, uh, Jim is Jim is somebody I know pretty well. I went to, to uh, uh, university with him, so I, I got to know him as a friend as well as as also a business leader, um, open source social good leader. Uh, and for a long time, he ran something called Benetech. Uh, and he's kind of graduated out of that, um, and but he couldn't actually retire uh, because he has too much fun working. So uh, now his new gig is Tech Matters. Um, I was I, I brought him up recently, kind of in the, in a similar question. There's there's something that Jim does really well, which is 
have a foot in both kind of business sense and social good sense. And, and he gets social good software, usually projects funded. Um, uh, and if you look at it one way, he's just doing startups. And if you look at it another way, he's just doing social good. Um, it, takes a, it takes a talented kind of set of people that can live in both environments uh, and talk to funding partners about why this thing makes sense. And if you're talking to funding partners about why this makes sense, you, you really need to know why it makes sense. So there's a whole bunch of Jim and his team working on a software architecture and fit to purpose and things like that, like a startup does. Um, uh, and I think that's really important. Um, it's important to essentially build a, bit, a good business. So Jim's, you know, when he's doing a project, he ends up with a, a business case um, and a technology case and an architecture that all makes sense um, in, in economic reckoning. And I don't, so I, I think one of, the, one of the things that is, is kind of tempting to, um, uh, it, it's tempting to say you can kind of end, oh, this is a social good project. It doesn't need to make sense economically because we hate the capitalism thing. So that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, capitalism, you know, can do all kinds of bad things, but um, the thing that it does well, a thing that it does well, and also then it takes that, the thing that it does well and, and makes it a horrible thing in the world. But um, the th a thing that the, the structure does is evaluating fitness for purpose and evaluating, um, you know, it, it evaluating things on business case. And so a thing that I've learned from watching Jim over the years is that you can do that kind of thing. And it doesn't mean that you have to do it in a capitalist, capitalistic frame, but you kind of still need to do the, you know, essentially an economic value, a validation of what you're trying to do. You know, why, why does this matter? Um, and you have to make that case to people who think, so I guess Jim and I are technologists and Jim's a lot better at me at, at also interfacing with, you know, funding partners and things like that. But there are people like Jim and I who are experts at, at technology. And then there are people who are experts, experts at evaluating um, uh, evaluating social solutions or, or uh, um, public policy solutions and things like that. And they, you know, and, and there's an interface where the technical people can build, an, you know, not only the technical architecture and all that kind of stuff, but also the economic model, the, the, um, the, the service model. And then the, essentially the business people, the public policy people can talk that and take over with that and and go okay you know these are the way these are the ways your analysis makes sense these other other things are where you're going to run into pub, public policy problems or you're not serving the right populations or things like that and so i think that i i think an answer kind of to, to dave to your question is is to take the good things that we've learned from capitalism and economic development and things like that and not throw those away take take real serious um uh responsibility for doing a good job you know not only technically but but also socially and in a public policy sense and stuff like that and that ends up taking multi multidisciplinary uh, interaction and analysis and, and cooperation, things like that. Thanks, Pete. Um, another great place to look is the, the Internet Archive uh, for clever business models and for a bunch of other stuff about how do you preserve data for a long time. Um, yeah, and I guess, and I agree with you, Peter. I guess one of the things I think is missing is, is kind of the cookie cutterness, right? It's like we've learned a whole bunch of stuff about how that works, which is exactly what you're saying, but it isn't um, codified sufficiently that you can take it to public policy people and they grok it, right? It's it's not part of our normal process yet, and that's I think the that's the stage where we should be at 20 years later, but we're not, you know. And so the state of California is still floundering to try to figure out what to do with this stuff because they don't have a oh this you do you handle this kind of stuff this way, and I think one of the assumptions that I've got is that data 
the data layer of the stack is not the product, right? You want products growing out of the data layer, right? Any more than Linux is the product, you know, Linux is the infrastructure. You want products growing out of that. So you want a lot of capitalistic investment in reusing the data, right? But you don't want the data to be the, the, the capitalistic investment, right? Because that makes it scarce. You want it valued at its marginal cost, which is zero, right? So data is abundant. How do we, how do, we do that in practice, you know? Um, and, and that I just think is the uh, opportunity that we still got out there. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Gil and Grace have more comments on this. Yeah, a couple of things. Pete, you said that interdis uh, good interdisciplinar inter interdisciplinarity is necessary for this. That's probably true for most anything useful. Um, so just note that. Um, um, capitalism is good at a certain kind of fitness for purpose, but it ignores all sorts of things, both costs and benefit side. So that's the problem there. It's not the market mechanism itself. It's what the market mechanisms are blind to. Uh, but I don't want to go there now. I want to stay on the open source question. I have long-standing dear sweet spot for that. Um, and one of my personal lasting regrets is that I didn't open source the first, the, well, we built the first corporate sustainability dashboard back a hundred years ago and could have open sourced it, probably should have and didn't. And now there's a, a jillion of them. And they're, you know, anyway, slow, slow path there. Um, my concern about open source always has been that it seems to depend on volunteerism uh, and volunteerism doesn't give us a sustainable business or economic model going forward. It's, su it's subsidized as, as I know. Are you just, are you disagreeing with me or are you saying, yeah, you agree that that's a bad thing? Don't um, know. Dis my, disagree. Just, on, let me, yeah, let me just rip a little longer. Let me get into some more trouble and then jump on it. Excellent. Uh, it, it seems to me that it depends on the generosity of people who are resourced in other ways to be able to spend time to develop open source stuff, which is great and laudable and I love it, but um, that doesn't suggest to me sustainability and scale and permanence. Um, so that's one question. It may be that universal basic income is one of the ways to address that um, because right now it's only people who have the luxury of being able to donate their time who can do that. Uh, I'm somebody who doesn't. I have to, you know, when I think about doing something meaningful, I always have to think in personal terms about how does that sustain me and Jane financially, which I'd often much rather not have to do, but I do. Um, so UBI may be a piece of that puzzle. Um, the, um, the other thing is just to expand the discussion about open source is really a discussion about the commons. And so I want to broaden it out to not just be thinking about open source software, but how do we deal with common resources, common assets, uh, and non-extractive ways of developing and leveraging uh, what those common resources are. Which is what, Dave, what I heard in, in, your, in your last comment. Uh, you didn't use those words, but that was how it landed in my head. Um, you know, where there's, a, where there's data that is, that, is an, that is analogous to the commons and there's applications and uses made of that, but they have to not degrade the common layer and the common capability and the, and the, and the capacity of the commons to move forward from that. So I'll stop there and I wanna hear what that was. Um, I'll do, uh, Pete, if you don't mind, I'll jump in briefly and then you know more than I do. Um, so my favorite example here is IBM in the early days of open source where IBM realized they had five different web server projects internally and that mm -hmm. web server wasn't a differentiator. So they mm -hmm. adopted, adopted Apache and then mm -hmm. they started assigning programmers who were paid a full salary by IBM to work on Apache, Linux, mm -hmm. Eclipse. And at some point, many years ago, IBM had some 600 coders who were being paid full-time salaries by IBM because IBM saw it in its best interest long-term mm -hmm. to actually mine the commons. That's interesting. That's interesting, and that's sustainable. And a mixture of people who have passion, people who have projects, companies that have interests, and realize that their best interests are pooled. That's that's huge here. And a lot of insurance companies used to be mutual aid societies and demutualized de years ago and became corporations. I think most insurance ought to be mutual aid, and and that's some, really some of them still are. And some of them are remutualizing. It's very it's a very interesting sort of function. It's a little bit like. Well, Cooperatives, the, the, right? The one that Ben Franklin started uh, 200 whatever years ago is still mutual. Right. Which one it is? Um, but but mutually run insurance companies are rare rare species these days, unfortunately. Yeah. But 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 I think that there's this shift of, of of humanizing capitalism when it starts to realize that shared assets are super important and they need to invest mm -hmm. in them for their own profitable business. Mm -hmm. And if we can figure that out, that message out for the data layer. Mm -hmm. uh, that gets really, really interesting in different ways. So that might, that's, I think that's a piece of Dave's question. Uh, Pete, mm -hmm. then Grace. 
Um, I my my disagreement was was largely what Jerry said. Um, I also want to honor what 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 Gil said. Um, there are an insane number. Um, I don't know if it's dozens or hundreds, but an insane number of like absolutely critical, like the linchpins of our internet, you know, servers or routing or technology or yeah. DNS or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's insane. There are literally projects where, you know, everybody, everybody in the world uh, who's using a computer is depending on one one person um, who's been doing a job for 20 years or whatever. So it yeah. totally does happen. And it's insane yeah. that we let that go even. Um, uh, but there is also definitely a model. Uh, uh, the, the one that Jerry is talking about is the one that I was thinking of. Uh, there are a bunch of companies, big and small, that have realized that um, they're working on, on code uh, that's, you know, important to their business, but not a uh, competitive advantage for them to hold secret or anything like that. And so they get a lot of value out of making it open. Um, so I, I think I've also, I, I, I worked, uh, uh, Jerry and I have a friend who's got a, uh, 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 Jerry, I'm thinking of Greg Ellen. Uh, our friend Greg has a, an open source uh, software company that serves federal government agencies um, with key, you know, key functionality. Um, and it was interesting watching him. Um, uh, he, he chose early on to make his system open source um, and he got a little bit of benefit out of it and, and a lot of kind of unbenefit from it. Um, there's, there's something, there's a tricky line to, um, and, and I've done this too, I've made a bunch of stuff open source and I don't get any benefit of it. They're just leeches, you know. Um, uh, it, I think there's a, there's a way that we don't help open source people that, that would be really nice to have. And there's a way that the, those infrastructure people I was talking about, there's, we need some function that recognizes that, uh, hey, there's a public good here. And let's, uh, in, in I think Greg's case, it would help a lot actually just to market the fact that he's got an open source solution. He should be having, so what, what happens in his world is he gets onesie twosie uh, contributors. Um, uh, he doesn't have the, he's, he's got to do sales and marketing to his customers. He doesn't have the time to do sales and marketing to an open source community that kind of isn't there yet. Um, I've got, I've had that same problem with open source stuff, right? It's, oh, it's open source and people could be using it to make their, their lives better and make the, the, the code base better, but nobody picks up that. I don't have time or I don't have the talent to do the marketing that that it takes to build a community around the open source that I've got and my projects are smaller so it doesn't matter so much but. Um, we need we need I like the technology models are there the business models are there the thing that we don't have is kind of the marketing and distribution models, we don't have an awareness that there are these common space solutions that are you know they're commons based but they're super small because nobody cares nobody knows about it nobody's able to know about it because of the way that we do sales marketing so th there's a missing piece there in in getting the world to you know help itself um help or, or help these open source software developers help everybody it's interesting weird um before coming to grace uh, steve balmer many years ago um did a bunch of stupid things but um but also uh, one day he said, aha, I've figured out what's broken about open source. And he said, look, there's all, there's this super long tail. Open source is, claims to be these thousands of people contributing, but it's really only this, this, you know, front end of the distribution. And, and then I think it was uh, Ethan Zuckerman or, or maybe it was Clay Shirky who said, mm -hmm, exactly. There's this long tail because there's no membrane that the, I think it was Clay Shirky. That the, that the membrane that surrounds open source software is permeable. You can go in and you can copy it, you can look at it, you can do whatever you want with it. And then a few of those people, and, and maybe all that means is that you learn what to do with it, but a few of those people contribute back um, uh, improvements, which then get folded back into the software. And that's how the damn thing works. And Microsoft, for everybody they hire, they have to pay benefits, get them an office, do all these. So there's a very hard barrier around what Microsoft built, in particular, if they're trying to protect their code and make it proprietary, they then have to make the code secret, which creates a whole bunch of other problems. And then this, this dynamic, a lot of companies have shifted their brains over to, hey, 
participating in shared assets really works as long as the assets are, and here I'm overgeneralizing probably, lower in the stack so that, so that having common assets at that level really works. And then they're all like, great, so MySQL or name your open source project. Uh, we're just all gonna contribute to a bunch of these things because otherwise it doesn't get better. Um, and then we're gonna worry about the secret sauce that we're going to add, which we may keep proprietary, but then we're gonna build a whole lot of projects. Uh, and IBM saved the company by adopting open source and within a couple of years was selling two or $3 billion in service revenues using mostly open source software for their projects. Now over to you, Grace. <laughs> Um, this is a really rich conversation, and we all have very different perspectives on it, and it's quite interesting. And uh, there's a couple of things I want to point out. One is that it really connects to how you open, Jerry, with this idea of, like, how can I do the stuff that contributes the most to the world and make a living? I've actually, in my life, completely separated that out. It's like a wall between them, the stuff that makes money and the stuff that I want to do. And I'm trying, you know, like you, I'm working on raising funding right now for a very specific project. Um, and if it doesn't work, then I'll find another way. So the first thing that I have to say about resources and money, and you know, I love to talk about money, um, is that resourcing needs to be thought about a little bit differently. I think that there's tremendous amount of resources and um, I definitely am aligned with what Gil said, like, you know, maybe it's maybe it's UBI or, you know, people who are resourced in some other way. And I've said, a, you know, several times, if the Ethereum Foundation, when they raised all that money, bought, you know, some land and some solar panels and some, you know, whatever, and said to people, look, we're not paying anybody, but we're creating our own ecosystem separate and parallel, then they wouldn't really care so much what the value of Ethereum is in dollars because they'd have their own actual ecosystem. But they forgot in their ecosystem discussion about human bodies, which is part of like the programmers who have to do this stuff. And so I think for open sourcing, you know, you have to think about resourcefulness another way. And I think the difference in our perspectives has to do with the timeline and the trajectory. It's kind of like right now we still need money but there's a trajectory in which we can create separate economies or different types of economies. And that's a longer trajectory. Um, I tend to work on that longer trajectory, which is I work in reputational systems. And this week I'll have something, by the way, for you guys working on my, finally got my video together. But, um, you know, I'm working on a longer trajectory, but it's kind of like, how do we have one foot here and one foot there and, you know, like move towards this better world while we still need some sort of financial resources. And I've been like both for myself and for the projects I work on, always asking this question, like how do you become less and less dependent on the fiat system for the types of resources that you need? One of the answers, by the way, in that framework, which is really interesting, not yet working, is Holochain. And they're an open source project. In the they're not a blockchain, they're a distributed ledger technology. And Holochain is a foundation which owns a company. And the company is designed to create, uh, it's a, you could say competitor to Amazon today, to AWS. And they've got boxes, I've got one in my house that's not working, uh, but I just reset it and rebooted it. And I was like, oh, this new version didn't work, but great, you know, it's an alpha. And the idea is that each of these host boxes is, is you know, hosting data and the hollow company, hollow limited is going to get some percentage of that for running the network. And that's a computer resource. So it's like a, it's a computer data farm and processing power farm, which is owned by the hollow chain foundation, which is the open source foundation. So the foundation owns a company which produces a resource. Will it work? I don't know. Hopefully they'll get out of alpha one, one day and we'll see. But I really like that idea of like, we're going to create a company that's that's owned by our open source foundation, which kind of flips it on its head, right? It's like, oh, how does Red Hat fund this or IBM fund this? And regarding some of the, I mean, there's there are, I would not call them unintended consequences to having these kinds of like IBM working for this, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the examples is this issue of identity, which is very close to what David's pointing out with data, like who owns the data. Now, how did we get into this situation where Google and Facebook ended up our data with our data? You can listen, there's a really great 20 minute talk by Harry Halpin 
at Web3, where he talks about, look, a bunch of us were sitting around trying to figure out how many bits, bytes, you know, length of whatever hashes, blah, 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 for self-sovereign identity for open ID. In the meanwhile, Google's like hiring people off of us and creating their own Google ID and Facebook ID. And now everywhere you log in, you're like, log in with Google, log in with Facebook, instead of this open ID, which was the idea because a bunch of open source people were arguing about it. And he's like, every time I turned around, one of the guys who was on my team last week is like, oh yeah, I got an offer from Facebook. Oh yeah, I got an offer from Google. And that's the not unintended consequences of this model of, yeah, you know, IBM has some people working on it. And we still have that in the self-sovereign identity space, you know, and, and these companies aren't one thing. So Microsoft is very heavily into that self-sovereign identity thing. And part of them is like doing all the stuff the self-sovereign identity people want because they're kind of fighting against Google and part of them who knows what they're doing with the data. And it's, it's quite confusing. Um, and when it comes to data and sovereignty, it's very difficult to even know what ownership is. I think that it's the wrong phrase. I think ownership, like when we talk about data theft, it's a lot more like assault because people are manipulating our minds without our knowing. And so we're calling it data theft, but I think it's assault. Um, especially you're talking about health data, right? Who is going to know that my hand is shaky and that my hearing is going first? Well, let me tell you, it's going to be Google and, and Amazon because mm -hmm. they're listening in. They're going to know that I turned up the volume. Um, and so that's really, that's the world we're in is not data theft, but really data assault. And so um, what are, how are these resources used is incredibly important and really having kind of a long-term vision of like, how does this get resourced outside of the capitalist system is important as we do get resources from the capitalist system and look like, how are we creating a different world, maybe in a you know, decade or two decades? So that's kind of how I, I look at that problem. Thanks, Grace. One small thing before I go to Julian. Um, Jordan Sukut has been in, in our groups, uh, uh, not in these calls very much, but he's been very involved in sort of OGM in general and has a very ambitious project going. But he's a, uh, he spent a bunch of years trying to figure out what is a model that creates a stable enterprise that doesn't need to eat the world. And he came up with something called steward ownership, which he did not invent. Uh, it's kind of an older model. There's a bunch of companies in Europe that are steward owned and steward the, the, the TLDR for steward ownership is there's a nonprofit that owns all of the shares of a for-profit. And he takes the standard, whatever country this exists in, you take the, the standard issue C Corp in the US and a 501c3 or whatever, uh, you know, in the US, those are, those are, they have deep roots in the legal system. Everybody knows how to do them. But when the nonprofit owns all the shares, then the mission of the for-profit is tied to the, the mission statement of the nonprofit. And as long as you sort of maintain control of the board of the nonprofit, you can direct the enterprises for this thing in, to do good in the world. It doesn't need to like suck the value out of everything it touches because otherwise shareholders will, will sue it. Uh, and it's interesting, but complicated. It's one of many different schemes that are now being proposed. And I think that we're in a moment right now of this kind of punctuated equilibrium uh, of trying to figure out what are the new platforms. And you know, one of the candidates for the new platform is, hey, it's all gonna be crypto and DAOs and NFTs. And another one is you know, Zuckerberg saying, no, just, just come into my economy and we'll have a metaverse. And that's like, we're actively in that, that set of conversations now. Um, Julian, then Gildan, let's get back to the queue. I wanted to agree vehemently with Grace and mention that I have an unopened Amazon Echo, highest bidder can get it. Nice, thanks Julian. Um, Gil? Yeah, mine is open, I ran it for a day and then stuck it in a drawer, so I got another Echo available for somebody who wants that. Um, Homie, don't play that. Um, I put in the chat um, a Harvard article listing about a half a dozen or a dozen corporations, major uh, legacy corporations that are owned by foundations. So that model is there. Uh, we're start, we're seeing a lot of work on these hybrid corporate structure for, for firms and the growing momentum toward cooperatively owned businesses. Uh, and how do you transition a privately held business into cooperative, cooperatively held business and the various layers of, of ownership, uh, stewardship, reward, governance and different ways of structuring each of those very creative work going on there. Um, that's something that I'm looking at because I'm, as, as I think most of you know, I'm trying to stand up a fund um, to uh, do sustainability turnarounds exiting to co-ops. 
So I'm deep into that literature. And by the way, just a shameless plug, I'm looking for a really inspired uh, MBA, uh, MBA analyst type person to help me work on this who really cares about the stuff we're talking about. So if you know anybody, send them my way. Thanks, Gil. Um, back to our queue, Mr. Carranza, Stacy, then Bill. Hi there. I saw that Allison, uh, you had your hand up. Did you have anything to contribute? Oh, my apologies. Um, go ahead, Mark. I was going to join in the conversation late. It was always interesting. We talk about comments, money, all that stuff. I get excited, but sure. <laughs> I'm patient. Uh, love uh, what I caught as possibly a Freudian slip from good David Wetzel. Um, he started an insult, no, insight. And I noted that. Bam! Oh, wow, that's, that's fantastic. Um, this week, somebody called me white. Somebody called me a white man. Mm -hmm. And boy, is that fantastic. That's so <laughs> insulting and insightful. And not to <laughs> insult white men. Hi, white man, how you doing? <laughs> but the person who, who said that um, is a woman of color, of power in my organization. Mm. And uh, I have to uh, you know, talk to the HR people and say, hey, you know, this is really dangerous kind of, uh, you know, area that, that we're kind of going into. Mm -hmm. um because you know you know the way i feel that this woman operates is kind of as a bully and Ooh. she bullies with women of color and and yeah. and you know uh, sort of uh, a kind of wokeness and I, boy do i feel uncomfortable um but hey we 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 love that so um we had a Friday gathering where we, um, in person outside, talked about, you know, some of the trolling that we were getting about the D-Web, the distributed web. And it turned out that on Twitter, and I, I have not gone to Twitter and I have not seen this, but the trolling was by furries. Now, this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard, that the furries are trolling the distributed web because they think that nfts are you know um, extractive bullshit and i tend to agree with them but i'm trying to find um you know counter examples and i've listened to a lot of nft talks and and, and we're having another um, virtual talk about you know what is the ethical position of the internet archive when it comes to the big new shiny thing, which basically is the, um, what did I see uh, about Canada's Yukon? They called it the stampede to, to go get the gold. Um, and this fascinates me. And it fascinates me because what led up to this was um, somebody talked, I talked, and then it was like, hey, we don't want all these white men talking. I'm like, what? And this notion of speaking order was brought up and I hadn't heard of speaking order. I searched online. I didn't find it, but I knew about the progressive stack, which basically says, hey, the non-dominant people speak first. And this is really weird because in my research on speaking order, it's like, hey, the powerful people speak last. It's like, wait a second, this just doesn't make sense. We want the powerless people to speak first, but normally the more powerful people speak at the end. What the hell is going on? I don't know. But, you know, to me, dominance, non-dominance individually is just more pointedly an experience than any group experience, whether I have a group experience as Chicano or whatever kind of gender queerness I have, it's totally not your business. <laughs> it's like, you know, if you think I'm a man, I'm fine with that. I guarantee you. That. <laughs> How many priests do I have to blow to prove you wrong? <laughs> that would be like an acid test. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, so my um, 
best mutual unsilencing experience in a living group was in the early 80s Abalone Alliance anti-nuclear consensus process. I'm just going to post what I found online with the American Heart Association of all people and a wonderful woman who documented the consensus process for them. Everybody gets heard. And and there's you know there's different models of it and it's really kind of interesting but you know the success of this in the Abalone Alliance you know as Doug Engelbert noted as as of all human systems it critically depends on all participants being trained that is a human investment of of real time of real people which Mira is is very very difficult to negotiate, um, and it's further improved by at least one, possibly more, trained facilitators in the live back and forth of the consensus process. And what was very fascinating reading Progressive Stack on Wikipedia that Progressive Stack is just an imperfect way of eventually getting to a consensus process. <laughs> so. I don't know, and I'd really like to figure out if there is a wisdom of crowds type with study of wisdom of consensus, where basically, you know, where it's truly wise and where it's an anti-pattern. And I haven't seen any D DAO processes embracing similar values of the consensus process. And if anybody is aware of that and, you know, or knows about this sort of wisdom of crowds, wisdom of consensus, where it works, where it doesn't, because of, of course it doesn't work everywhere. I, I'd really be interested in that. But um, uh, basically, what do I do about being white? You could stand this up on a stage somewhere and get a really interesting set of conversations going, Mark. You've um, you've popped open a, a bunch of really interesting Pandora's boxes. Um, I took a course from Scott Peck long ago, uh, where one of the important things he covered at the beginning was consensus. Like, what do we think consensus is? And there's many, many different flavors of consensus. Some people think consensus means everybody said yes, and it's 100% agreement of all the participants. And that is a very debilitating kind of consensus because it gives every player full veto power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you know how this plays out, but the, the questions you're asking, some of the questions you're asking are at the heart of collective decision-making. Who gets to speak in what order, for what reason, how do we then come to some agreement? Uh, what is the agreement process? All those kinds of things are, are important. You know, and, and these are very ogm -y questions extremely. And then, and then what is each of the individual's identities? How much does that play a role in what's going on? Uh, how do we call in or call out those dynamics or those those aspects of self? What role? That that's really like it's hot on the table right now for society as well. Uh, anybody with thoughts who'd like to contribute to this the set of issues that Mark put on the table? Pete, um, I I wish I could talk about what to do about white, but I can't. Um, but I I wanted to note that um, consensus. One of the one of the strange places uh, we see consensus happening um, that isn't examined enough is Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia has a really broad and and really deep consensus process, and uh, if you've ever gotten caught up into it, it's it's mostly painful and un, un, unfriendly and and makes you crazy. Um, it's incredibly Byzantine. It's incredibly unfair. Uh, there's all kinds of terrible things that happen, and yet it still works. Um, so I I don't necessarily say that that Wikipedia is where do you where you would go for the best example of consensus. But on the other hand, um, the people who maintain Wikipedia and talk about what Wikipedia should post where and what Wikipedia should delete or not delete. Um, is a running example, you know, a decades long example now of how how humans do consensus. And I don't think anybody's killed anybody because of Wikipedia consensus process, which is which is 
if if you study humans doing consensus, that's like a, a pretty high bar um, because um, humans humans at scale just suck at consensus. Um, so um, so uh, if you're interested in consensus, um, I I think. Uh, I've, I've done a little bit of uh, spelunking into, you know, how Wikipedia does that, and it's fascinating and Byzantine and and a good object lesson in what's practical and what's not. Um, so, um, and and more people should do that, and more people should write it up because it it works, um, even though you know working at scale with lots of humans is is a mess. Um, but I, I don't mean to say that it's, you know, a mess and a failure. It's a mess and not super successful, but, you know, more successful than many political, uh, national political systems, for instance, uh, Stuart, which, which then, are even more of a mess. Stuart, then back to the queue. Uh, you're muted. One of the things that, 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 that popped in mind is um, this notion is uh, of, uh, we becoming a uh, we become a culture of victims. Uh, so many people are wearing their 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 victimhood as an identity, and it's amazing how that's snowballing. And um, um, it's something that that of all people, Anne Rand kind of warned against <laughs> um, that we become a culture of of of, of needy people, of victims, um, and it. Uh, just a thought, just a little bra brain flash. I don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So Stuart, that's yet another Pandora's box. Um, <laughs> really, truly a big one. Um, and it, it's, it's really complicated. I think um, part of this is that there are a whole bunch of people who are the product of generations of crap and shit and abuse. Uh, which has not been recognized, which has not been healed, which is which has set them at a complete disadvantage, and declaring those kinds of things isn't to me victimhood. It's like, God damn it, would somebody please like recognize this thing happened? Then there's a whole bunch of other dynamics, including people of privilege claiming that they're the victims, or reversing. It's basically Darvo. It's uh, you know reversing victim and 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 uh, aggressor. Um, and it's happening all the time right now. It's a very, it's a very clever strategy, you know, in, in play. And then there's a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of shades of pastels in between. Um, so at the risk of eating the rest of our, of our call time right now on this particular topic, I think it's a fascinating topic and would love to come back into it at some point. Yeah. Just, just, just very, very briefly, Jerry, I, I was, I was, um, really pointing to the latter to the to the latter phenomena not the not not the former I, I couldn't agree with you more that you know that yeah there are systemic problems challenges of, of abuse and degradation that we have to address otherwise we're not moving any place mm -hmm. um, thank you and thanks for clarifying that um, and then I'm going to put a link in the chat to this spot in my brain in case anybody wants to go wander through the culture of victimhood white victimhood, the, the empire of trauma, a bunch of different things that I've collected up on, on the topic. Um, and let's go back to our queue, which right now has Stacy Bill Allison. So I, what's living for me was framed by four things. One was a podcast that I listened to, which was Doug's from a few years ago. The other was the um, week two, the second session of what we're doing with Ken listening to that, which really confirmed for, like I keep saying the starting point is with the food system and that confirmed it. The other thing was the incident that happened on the OGM mailing list. And the final thing was um, Jordan's email about the meta project. And those four things, not just frame what I came here with, but what everybody here said today, all fits neatly within that. Um, and Jerry, you mentioned, um, so first I wanna say, I, I wanna say with the Jordan thing, I think there really needs to be a meta discussion about the email about the meta project. That's because, so meta. <laughs> and because you were talking about repurposing Tuesdays and Wednesdays call, my suggestion to everything living in, the, in this um, frame is that Tuesday, be the meta conversations. And in this case, I would 
really want to discuss the email, Jordan's email, not the, not the incident. And then the next day, a different set of conversations, which I had spoken to Ken about hosting, would talk about the conversation that Dave brought up. And that would be the way you framed it, where you asked the questions and everybody talked about it in like a normal way. And you didn't have to worry about the things that happened in the incident. Um, so that's where I am right now. And um, I think, oh, I think it's real, as far as needing that meta conversation before the starting point, it's because you can't just ru rush in and say, all right, everybody start. There isn't one starting point. Every one of us is already on our own starting point. And before we decide where we're going to stand, we need to know each other better. You know, the split that Grace talked about where we have our professional and then who we are as a person. Is that the world we want where we're two different people all the time? Um, just knowing that somebody's in a group doesn't mean we're going to have instant trust with them. There are a handful of people in OGM that I really, really trust. But the rest, I like, we seem aligned, but I'm not ready to say I'm dedicating you know, my life to working with you for the greater good. So I think the reason I want those meta conversations is aside from being able to learn how to look at things differently, we're really, we have to get used to having the difficult conversations with the people we're closest to first before we just mix everybody in the pot. So I'm complete. Um, Stacy, thank you for, for putting so much thoughtful material in about how we structure what we do and where we're aiming and, and all of that. I'm, I'm, I appreciate thank that. You. Thank you. Um, anybody else's comments on, on those thoughts? Otherwise, let's go Bill, Allison, Sean. Oh, hi. I, uh, I feel a little bit like uh, I really haven't been in these conversations very much, although I've watched several of the videos. So, but I will say, well, first about being white, my wife has told me we just did our voting. She goes, don't take it personally, but I'm done with white men. So, and, you know, and actually just as a side thing, as we're voting, we're trying to look at who are the younger people running? Who are the people who, I live in Austin, Texas. So who are the people who are not white that are actually running for offices? Because we vote for judges. We, the miss, it's, it's a bit of a Michigas here. Anyway, um, so that's... Uh, it's just an, it just came up when you all were talking about. And I think I've mentioned before, I'm basically trying to unlearn everything I learned about growing up as a privileged white boy in New York City about how the world actually works and how fortunate I have been to have been born that way at that time. Um, I think what Stacy said about this thing about trying to get to know each other is it just can't be it just takes time it really to and you know this we're all i mean i'm quite used to the zoom thing and seeing people and having little chit chats and but it just in a way you can't rush it maybe that's the good news maybe i'm too old for this so <laughs> the only news is it takes time but I will say one thing I've come across, and I've been reading a lot from people who are just not from the European tradition. And one author I've really been affected by is Amitav Ghosh, who has written a couple of books about climate change. One called The Great Derangement, which I'm reading for the second time, which is even more illuminating than the first time. And his recent book um, called The Nutmeg's Curse, which opened to me up to really paying attention to the world as not just being mechanistic, but being vitalistic, about actually trying to look at this tree outside my window as my companion while I'm living here in Texas, not just this big tree. And so that he is trying to really unearth some sensibilities about what he calls 
unseen beings and hidden forces, which, you know, we humans have talked about for a long, 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 long time. And I'm just trying to open myself up when I take my walks about trying to just pay a little attention to the, <laughs> the dormant grasses in the lawn rather than just stomping across them. But so it's for me, it's really, I'm in a kind of, a, I don't know, unsettled in the sense about I'm trying to look at things differently than my scientific, I mean, I studied chemistry for 10 or 12 years. So in a way, I learned how to think by doing all that uh, study. And now it's like, hmm. it feels like it's got some blinders associated with it. And I've mentioned this before, but I read, a, I think that we are living in a time that's very much like the 1820s and 1830s on the earth. There was an international, everybody in the world was kind of talking about the same thing, even though they didn't have the communication we had, but there was a big change in how countries and uh, interactions and international interactions happened. And it just feels to me that that's what's happening now. Well, can you say a little more about the kinds of movements or events or things that were happening in those decades that, that are resonating for you? Well, from what I've read, so, you know, that's, uh, I already know what I know. Um, and not being a well, vampire, well, people, you weren't alive then. Well, but people talk about, you know, there was just this thing about, oh, the, you know, the Industrial Revolution and this thing happened. It wasn't, the Industrial Revolution never really, quote, happened in the world until, you know, after the 1850s even though there were many inventions done years, decades, decades before, people still behaved the old way. There were big landowner kind of systems. There were royalty kinds of systems. There were this, you know, and this idea about really having market-based capital. It's like in the 20th century, we sort of took that, well, Pete's known this, you know, we drove that, we drove that train off a ditch. Which is we're going to get on this neoliberal neo capitalist big time market is the answer. We're on this thing as a you know, as a world, and I think it's like just like well, yeah, well that's a big wall we just ran into. So I just feel like there was a and things were happening around the world, you know, in uh, in uh, like the Ottoman Empire was, you know, that really didn't end until after World War One. Right. It's like, well, wow. So there was still a bunch of thinking that we sort of have, a, a, had, at least when I grew up, had an odder picture of. I hit a, I hit a stat that I, that it's really stuck in my head and I just put it in the chat, which is that at the U.S. Civil War, 80% of Americans were farmers. And that shifts dramatically between there and World War I down to 20%. Like boom, everybody goes into cities, into factories, leaves the farm. It's so like, like an insane transition. And today, 1.5% of Americans are farming, right? So, so then it tapered and it went all the way down to 1.5 and who knows what the number is, right? The second, but, but, but the shift like civil wars, like 1861, 64, um, like, wow, that's really late. And we were still all out making food. Oh, and the other thing was like the development of the nation state and really having that become a kind of geopolitical unit that didn't happen until late in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Where we all sort of, everybody got it together. Like, this is the situation now. Here's how we're going to do it. So there was, you know, things were a bit, a lot more fluid. Aside from that, just, you know, rampant colonialism from, you know, my ancestors, whatever. And, and the internet was much slower back then. Um, but it seemed like there was one just because things were happening in every part of the world that were similar. Right. That Maybe it was just morphic resonance. Um, from Rupert Sheldrake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unseen beings. Exactly. Hundreds monkey. Um, thanks, Bill. Uh, let's go Allison, Sean, Grace. Hi, all white people, fellow white people. Here we are. 
and how that frames the Kaiyo, oh, really? Uh -huh. <laughs> Thanks for bringing all that up. I think it, there's just so much to cover that it's um, hard to know that place to begin. Um, and one word that comes to mind is equity and how we understand it, how we understand capitalism that had come up and how we frame our conversations and how much that has to do with who we are in the room and under what system we've been educated and to what degree economic trauma is having its way into our understanding of how things should work um, based upon a frame that has so much to do with this future security which is equity. And so it, the commons, I think, have everything to do with how we're leveraging power over one another and our fear of the future and our fear of having a piece of the future and our fear of having an equitable piece of the future and our fear of being compensated or not compensated or surviving tomorrow, the next day. Um, and uh, it has a lot to do with how we respond to things. I. I, um, yeah, I think it's interesting too um, that we have had a lot of similar conversations maybe come up, Bill, from, from that period of time in history. Right now, um, people are talking about money again, and that was a conversation that we'd had in, in, our, in our country throughout, throughout the history of its formation, right? From, um, our colonial beginnings and um, through with Henry George and progress and poverty and through the Gilded Age and the bimetallism and, and through the populism and um, and now it and then it kind of went dormant for a while as we told ourselves that this was we we're finally working it out and um, poverty was decreasing across the planet and that's still celebrated like what 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 myths we tell ourselves as indicators of going in the right direction are a lot oftentimes really mythological um that poverty is decreasing around the world has everything to do too with this sort of like <laughs> if we can go back to what stacy said about the food system and look at that and understand how that is emblematic of our essential selves. We are in relationship with nature. So yeah, that tree is definitely more than just a pretty tree outside. We're in relationship with that tree. The fact that it's there has a huge impact, not just on the oxygen or maybe the shade that you have outside of your door, but on your heart health and, and, and an enormous amount of factors in the way that we, our nervous systems are, are at rest or not at rest, which has an enormous impact on how we think and how we relate to one another as the state of our nervous system. And so the state of the planet and its health um, and our connection to that and feeling a part of that. And that's where food is. That's our ultimate connection into where there is no boundary between me and the biosphere. And so understanding those principles of, you know, biomimetic kind of design to understand what it is that we're going for, how do we keep our thought process in check with those fundamental prerequisites of life itself, instead of going off onto some mythologies that we've created under a financial system that has dominated like the, the, I've, I don't know, I, I, why do I come into the group and use my time? Probably because I'm at home. <laughs> um, I get to work from home right now. I'm teaching this whole process. Everything that we're talking about is pretty juicy. And I think that we talk about consensus making, we talk about governance and how do we really do governance and how do we really do economics and what role money has to do in that. And how can we have groups of people in consensus making where we don't really know how to do that? Well, where do we begin to know how to do that? 
where do we begin to identify what our needs and wants are and be able to communicate those in a way that feel good and that are open to consensus, not just because we want everybody to agree with the outcome, but because when we agree, we reach a possibility that transcends the thing that we thought we might be agreeing about because we get further input from each party. And, and that kind of equity in decision-making is synergistic instead of just sort of kind of like the budget mentality of, of how much of the pie are you gonna get and how much rightness are we gonna get and, um, and trying to split it up. It's not, life isn't like that. We're not, that's not nature. We don't have to be seeing everything as, as a budget and who's gonna have what say. And that's where we've been with equity. When we come together and we're all playing a role in it, the outcome is oftentimes beyond what we think that it could have been. And I think that that's some of the understanding about how to come together and co-create that I'm really feeling is important to be teaching with youth. And, um, and so I've brought it up to some of the people in the group before because we have um, Shimon, who's not here right now, who has kind of dedicated his time to a salutogenic project. And I'm not really sure um, that's it's really big. And if <clears throat> and so I think maybe you guys have heard him talk about salutogenesis. And I was really interested in that as a framework. Um, and I would be interested to see if you guys would like to poke holes at that model because it's something that I'm bringing into my classroom and my students and I'll drop an article in the chat in a minute. Um, in terms of how, how much does that help as a thinking tool to be able to ground our systems thinking into basic understanding of what human needs are, what it is that we're actually talking about, talking about how do I get my needs met right now and today? And how do I have a promise that my needs, my contributions will not leave me high and dry in the future? And that's been the main critical design flaw, I think, in our economy and our finance. Um, I don't know. So that's my proposal is maybe you guys would indulge me to be able to poke holes at a salutogenic model of thinking about monetary design and economics that I think would be as appropriate for, um, for Web3 people as I do for students who are understanding when, when the world is completely changing and our economic system isn't giving us the outcomes that we want, how do we look at design and, and understand how to design towards flourishing? So that's my that's kind of where I'm aiming at and wanting to be effective with it. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. And, and that feels like very much a part of the larger envelope of conversation that's around the money conversation that Grace uh, started for us a couple of weeks ago and that we need to go back and, and continue. So um, I think baking in some time to spend uh, learning about salutogenesis and then going, you know, going into it would be great. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Kronza. Uh, you're muted. Although, very lively. Yeah. I really suggest the handbook of Salutogenesis. It's a very interesting uh, uh, book. And I, I looked around for people who were criticizing it. And it's so unknown, it seems like it just hasn't gotten to a point of criticism. Um, or that's my impression. I'm happy to be proved wrong. Um, one... I mentioned this before, one of the bathroom books I have is um, at least for the last about three months is uh, Alvin Toffler's Future Shock. And in the back of the book, there's some solutions. Um, and they're surprisingly close to what I had kind of thought, which was basically stronger community. How we basically have a community in the skull, we have a community um, in our physical neighborhoods, we have a community for the people that we interact with on so many different levels. And how do we make those stronger and integrated? Um, uh, 
I did not see that in the saluted Genesis uh, literature as of yet. Um, but other than that, um, it's an interesting literature, and I also recommend it. There's a piece of this which is in the back of my head that just popped out because of what, the way you were saying what you were saying, Mark, which is I would love to find a way of, of synthesizing so that we understand better these different kinds of models. There, there's donut economics, there's salutogenesis, there's like countless of these communities and thinkers um, that are trying to figure out what the right answer is and how to solve these things. And how do we how do we crystallize them so that they're easier for one person to get a, a view of many of them? And then how do we pick the best of for what works for us? How do we find our way into communities that are doing work on each of these? And how do we uh, prevent or avoid um, trying to build one model to solve everything and say, this is the only model and everybody must adjust about this model and then everything will be okay because I don't think that works. But then, but then the question is, how do we find that coherence or alignment across these different movements and models so that they're not working across purposes and so that we're all pulling together for the benefit of humanity in some sense because some of these models are pretty contrary to the to each other right and and so i think that's a, an interesting project that's a very ogme project in the sense of how do we distill out of these things that some of their essence and so that they're understandable explainable and usable useful uh, in the world, and then I juxtapose them, compare and contrast essay contest. I don't know exactly, Allison. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a long process. So I think that I, you know, and it should be an evidence based process. So what impact does going through a curriculum and a des and designing and understanding these things have? on an individual's ability to connect, collaborate, co-create, and, and create systems that they can then prototype and see evidence. So what is it that the prototypes are going for, right? Well, it's going for regeneration. Well, which aspect of regeneration? Well, soil regeneration, and it's gonna be measured this way. And so, and that actually creates this return on investments if you can, you know, if you can have evidence of your, of your outcomes optimally. I think my, my fantasy and dream is that, you know, that we really have um, an evidence-based practice when it comes to economics. Who just won the Nobel Prize for Economics, the Nobel Prize for Economics, which just is not really a Nobel, of course, it's um, a, 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 right, a bank's um, nod to the experts in the field. And in 2021, it, it went to three men three white men, whatever, who had studied um, life. They actually researched impacts on people. So Ooh. things that that just, they were following the impacts of um, minimum wage and found out that lo and behold, against common economic assumptions that didn't decrease the amount of people working. That, that was a Nobel Prize that they actually stud, studied and un, unturned, like same thing with Eleanor Ostrom, right? That's what she did. She actually looked at stuff and blew up what the common assumptions of the, of the field were. And her and husband so, was an experimental economist who also was doing uh, that. Well, yeah, he, I mean, she, I think that his approach to try to make the commons work in real life and just continuously getting rejected because the profit margins weren't there for those who were funding the projects. That's what he kept getting rejected. And so she was able to step back and say, okay, I'm just gonna look at why the things that are already working work. And that's what she did. So they were completely like this. And I'm sure that, you know, without his pulling strings and things like that, her work wouldn't have been seen. Anyway, um, what was I starting to talk about? I got excited about something, but then there's something else to be excited about. <laughs> I love that. Thanks, Allison. Um, we're not going to make it through our entire queue. We have 10 minutes left on the call. My apologies to those of you I didn't get to. I have a long queue. I've got Sean, Grace, Pete, Ken, Julian, Gil, Mike, Michael. Um, so let's go Sean, Grace, Pete, and see how far we get. There you go. I'll be quick. Um, Hi, uh, Sean Murphy, um, longtime fellow traveler, uh, first time caller. Um, uh, I've, I've been uh, very, very, very dedicated to this whole uh, global mind uh, mission 
uh, myself for a very very long time and uh, and started a number of uh, a number of entities <laughs> to drive that forward <laughs> going back to uh, the early 90s and uh, um, yeah so uh, it's uh, it's lovely to uh, be among uh, um, such a band of uh, enthusiastic pursuers of uh, of this fresh kind of unity that we might uh, achieve in a glowing future hopefully one that that we survived until um <laughs> so, so. Uh -huh. um more uh, more a question about uh, about the <laughs> about the limits of of mortality than uh, than i think necessarily about the imminent collapse of civilization but um that's just a bit of hopefulness, I think. Um, anyway, so what I'm up to is, uh, yeah, I'm a technologist and I'm uh, beavering away at, uh, at trying to build, I'm a database kind of guy from way, way back, uh, a semantic web uh, sort of fellow, uh, more recently um, into, into blockchain um, perspectives on things, uh, but, um, Trying to trying to put all that into a um, uh, oh and very much a systems thinker a self organizing systems uh, enthusiast and uh, trying to bring all that together into a um, into a framework for into a stack essentially um, for collective cognition um, and uh, and so yeah no I've been a been a longtime fan of uh, of Jerry with his the biggest brain on the uh, on the internet and um, and um, yeah uh, I'm basically trying to build a in effect a multimedia um, semantic uh, semantically grounded um, uh, hosting framework for the great conversation if you would so um, nice to meet you all love that thanks John are you still in Berlin where are you I am in Berlin. Love that. Yes. Yeah. I used I lived on Ulanstrasse for a year when I was thirteen. So, oh, <laughs> that's yeah. that's that far. Yeah. I'm in Sweet. Uh, the only thing that I recognize from that neighborhood anymore is the Fogel Toy Store, which is where I used to get all my little model airplanes and stuff. <laughs> Haven't um, been there. It's cool. Um, let's go, uh, Grace, Pete, Ken. All right, so I'll also do a um, quick check-in. And what I really liked about Mike, uh, Mark's check-in was that he just kind of said what was bugging him. And uh, I'm in Italy right now. And in Italy, there's a three-tiered system. Um, you either have no pass, a green pass, or a super green pass. And depending on which type of tier you are, you have different privileges. If you're over 50, you are required to be vaccinated if you're a resident of Italy. Um, and if not, the fines are very high. And uh, if you don't have the right kind of pass, you can get into grocery stores even without any pass, but basically you can't get on a bus unless you have a super green pass. Um, wow. Which means um, vaccination, um, I don't know if recovery even counts within the last six months of either your second or third dose. And I refuse to carry digital identity like that. So I always go and I get a test and I will get a QR code just to you know, basically get around in a foreign country, but in my own country, I only use paper documentation that can't be scanned. Um, and here that basically meant I had to rent a car. I can't, you know, I can't use public transportation. I can't go to a restaurant. The only reason I'm even coming to this country is because my sister's, um, I haven't seen her, you know, since the start of this mess. And I probably won't see her for another couple of years at the rate this is going. And this was sort of the best place for us to be uh, based on her travel plans. And uh, yeah, it's really frightening. Um, you know, you see there's a really large uprising all over the world. Um, regarding these mandates, Canada's sort of at the forefront of that. And the way it's being reported by the media is like, these are a bunch of maniac anti-vaxxers rather than these are people who don't want to carry digital identity and let their government know when they had sushi. Um, and, you know, we started talking about data at the beginning of this thing. And I've been in the crypto industry for a while. And you know, Canada's frozen the cryptocurrency accounts of people who've contributed to this campaign that they believe in. 
Um, yeah, they, and they've, you know, businesses have had to close down because there was a hack of the people who donated to this campaign and for donating to the campaign, their bank accounts are now being closed down. And it's absolutely shocking to see what's happening. And, you know, to me, whether you're a freedom fighter or a terrorist just has to do with whether, you know, what side you stand on. And this is a civil disobedience campaign, as far as I can tell it, you know, whether I agree with it or not, it aligns with what I've been taught civil disobedience is. And these people are being portrayed as terrorists and, and having their bank accounts closed down and being put under emergency acts all over the world. You see tear gassing and fire hoses in Paris and in Brussels. And it's just, I don't know, absolutely shocking disintegration of civil liberties everywhere I look. And uh, that's what's been on my mind. That's a lot. That's heavy. Um, thank you. And you're kind of... I'm still didn't, white. I, 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 didn't, I love what you posted in the chat earlier about that. But I'm, yeah, but I'm in Europe. Yeah. I moved back to where I belong. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's really interesting how white changes over time, because if you were Italian, an Italian immigrant in the U.S. a long time ago, bah. and then if you're an Irish immigrant in the U.S. a long time ago, bah. you, you know, <clears throat> people who are now fall under the general umbrella of white were not considered white or whatever before white was a thing, right? It's all these ethnicities and all these differences really fragment us over time. Um, thank you, Grace. Um, let's, uh, a couple more people, Pete, Julian, Gill. Thanks, Jay. Um, uh, Grace, I would, I would, it would be really interesting to talk more about, uh, um, uh, civil disobedience versus, uh, I don't know, nuisance, terrorists, whatever. Um, but for another time, uh, I'm going to hit return on, on my news and I'm going to go through it really quick. The new issue of biweekly Plex Dispatch is out uh, yesterday. Um, click the link and read it. Um, send me stuff for next week or next two weeks. Um, uh, Wendy Elford and I have been working on websites for events. Uh, we've got one up, uh, the Water Choices one, um, and we're, we're getting orders to do more. So uh, this is it's coming along pretty well. And it would be interesting to talk a little bit more about what what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, Bill and I are talking about using Docker to deploy multiple massive wiki utilities uh, more easily. Um, so we're super excited about that. Um, I did, I kind of accidentally did a, a cool photo illustration uh, yesterday for Bioliquid Effects Dispatch. And I, I, I have a little bit of pride about it. I, I really like the image. Um, and so I've got an NFT, a clean NFT um, account I've, I was playing with last year. And so I put it up for sale there. And, and one, clean, one of the NFT, three- you, uh, mean, so, you mean not energy draining from the universe? I yeah, think. so it turns out NFTs are like a 99% horrible things. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're hundred percent horrible things. Um, the marketplace I'm in is a wonderful little marketplace. I have to warn you, it's be, it's it's got a little bit of not safe for work stuff in it now, and I don't know how to reconcile that um, because it's a wonderful community, and I don't want to limit expression, but I also now have a tr trouble sharing that marketplace with you know with people. So I don't know how to resolve that. But so don't click the NFT links if you're um, if you're not uh, not an NSF WS or something like that. Um, uh, and uh, recently I deleted Spotify. That's a link to my Twitter thing, why um, they have a podcast host who they believe in and I, and I can't. Um, it turns out Tidal is almost exactly like Spotify, but better kind of. Uh, so I'm super happy. I used uh, Tune My Music, a playlist converter. Um, the other two things are Sound Is and For Your Music are also playlist converters to get everything over. Um, uh, I use, I, I listen to music a lot. It's my primary kind of thing that I would spend money on after the internet. Uh, music is my next kind of got to have. And so um, I was really happy to find a new service um, that I could move to. And Sweet. that's me. Thanks, Pete. And thanks for the list. You're, I love that you like, boop, here you go um, with links. Um, Julian, you have the last word, I think, because we're going to have to wrap the call uh, after you. Well, mine is very quick because of putting out fires. I haven't actually gotten any work done. And especially with the kitty going in and out of the hospital, it's disturbed my workflow. So Pete brought up NSFW. And uh, 
can I close with that? Sure. My background is Sather Gate at UC Berkeley. And uh, the Sathers gave a lot of money to the campus. On this gate, the pillar on the left side says, in memory of Peter Sather, and gives his dates. And the pillar on the right side says, erected by Jane K. Sather, and gives her dates. And since the two of them were married for quite some time, I think the latter statement is a factual statement. So where is the gate? In Berkeley, that's right. It's uh, the old uh, campus boundary. So on, if you're standing looking at the gate there on the right side would be Sproul Hall and on the left side would be the student union. Cool. Sathergate, Pete's already found the Wikipedia link for it. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I actually need to transit. I'm happy to pass the con to somebody if everybody wants to stay in. Uh, we haven't heard from Mike and Michael, but I've got to boogie. Any, or shall we wrap the call? I've got to drop off too, so. All right. Thank you for uh, it. Letting me come in late. <laughs> yeah, drop in whenever. Uh, it's nice to see you, Mike. Thank you for for coming in. Um, thanks very much. It's been a it's been a great call, and uh, see you on the intertubes.